hello and welcome to the 97th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Wednesday the 31st of April 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we talk to John Patrick Leary about his new book Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism. John is an Associate Professor of English at Wayne State University in Detroit and he's also the author of A Cultural History of Underdevelopment, Latin America in the US Imagination. This week I have the new Patreons to thank Adam Arnold, Tom, John Watson, Clem Draper and Jake Palmer who upped his pledge. If you'd like to help keep the episodes flowing, you too can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month or about $1 an episode. We're extremely close to the Magic 50 Patreons when I'll produce an extra patron-only podcast every month. The remaining few patrons who sign up from now till then will receive an exclusive handmade commie badge as a bonus. So if that's your bag, just click on that there Patreon button. The patron-only podcast will be given a staggered release after six months, so even you, the filthy unwashed masses, can access them free of charge. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the interview. John, how did you get the idea for writing the book? The book is kind of a product of deep irritation. It's kind of where it started and it's like actually what's driven my my continued interest in it has been the deep wells of annoyance that the kind of language that I talk about in the book gives me. And so I started it when I was walking uh, in, I was in Chicago with a couple of friends and we were walking through a, some sort of food court in a shopping center or something. And we uh, just noticed, you know, billboards everywhere for like tech companies or computer software uh, or hardware manufacturers or whatever, just like billboards for any, any conceivable thing. And I just kept noticing how much and how meaninglessly the world innovation kept appearing. And so I, I just was like, what, you know, what are these people talking about? What does innovation mean? What are they innovating? And a friend of mine was just like, you know, you should write about, you should write about that. And so I looked into it and the word innovation has such a peculiar and to me, appropriate history for the way it gets misused and used now that I got really into kind of exploring the sometimes secret histories that illuminate the seemingly meaningless, arbitrary language of uh, contemporary bourgeois class, I guess you could say. Tell, tell us a little bit about the history of this word, innovate. Well, so innovation... Actually, uh, before you, before you start, yeah, you, you should know that before I had a role which was called innovations manager. There oh, you really? Go. Yeah. <laughs> so, what did you do all day as innovations manager? I innovated. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, the word has a religious and a political history that dates back to you know early modern England, where it was originally a term for a for false prophecy or for heresy or for conspiracy. So it was a kind of prohibited word. That is to say, it was it was a pejorative. To be called an innovator was to be accused of conspiracy against king and heresy against gods. Because if the transformation you were making, you know, if innovation means at some basic level a, a transformation or a improvement or improvisation upon something, what you're improving upon initially is the word of God or the order that his representatives are making in the world, you know? So if you're an innovator, you're, you you think that you know better than the king or than the the received word of the Lord. And so to be an innovator is to, to be condemned. And then the word gradually becomes kind of rehabilitated as in Protestant England as a, as a term for a kind of small scale improvement you can make in the world. And, you know, one of the, first people to write about this is um, uh, Francis Bacon, you know, the philosopher and uh, politician. And he points out that, you know, in Protestant, if we're Protestants, we can't really be opposed to religious innovation because our entire faith is built on the idea of uh, innovating upon the religious order of, of the world. And so he starts to propose thinking about innovation 
as kind of minor improvements. You know, you still can't presume to be remaking the world or in a in a fundamental sense because that's still sort of trespassing on God's domain. But you start to think about innovation as tweaks, and that generally is how we use it now. But as I argue in the book, it still retains that sense of prophecy and that sense of grandiosity, in part because of the way we use the word. I mean. And in part because of that history, I think. So, you know, when you talk, when you're in innovations, what was your job again? Innovations manager? That's right. And when you, what you say you did all day was you innovate, you know, so you, what you're doing is this kind of uh, ephemeral. God's work. <laughs> God's work. Yeah. But it's, but it's, but it's it, like all God's work, it's hard to describe. It's not a particular task. It's not a coherent or consistent thing. It's this kind of uh, ungraspable mystery. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's just meant to disguise the fact that managerial class people like to like to embellish what they do all day or what they don't do all day. But part of it also rests on this kind of religious history. And that's like a that's a feature of a lot of the words in the book, that they have this kind of moral content that aims to give this spiritual or artistic weight to the workaday world of business. This is a theme that kind of crops up again and again of trying to kind of put something spiritual into the mundane work mm -hmm. of management or capitalism. It seems yeah. to crop up again and again in the different words you picked throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, and it's uh, it's not and that's not itself new. I mean, that is what Benjamin Franklin in his autobiography claims that allows him to become successful is that he's so virtuous and he's his virtue and his commitment to a kind of moral rigor is what allows him to become materially successful so that's like a deep it's like, you know it's very deeply rooted in in the united states in particular it's the protestant ethic you know but i think in the contemporary context it's really emphatic and one of the things that makes it i think somewhat peculiar in our own moment is the ways in which the contemporary kind of moralistic vocabulary of capitalism draws on things that would seem to be opposed to it. So anti-orthodoxy, artistry, creativity, innovation as a kind of form of rebellion, the idea of uh, the creative manager, the creative CEO who is idiosyncratic and keeps odd hours and has some peculiar, you know, this, for example, this guy, this CEO of Twitter, I don't know if you've uh, heard about his bizarre eating and sleeping habits. Have you read about that? No, this is Jack, <laughs> is it? Jack, yeah. So he like only eats after 9 p.m. or something, and he s bathes in ice baths, and he meditates for three hours every day. I don't know when he does any work or if he does any work, but he, so he has this kind of, you know, routine about himself that, in which he claim, you know, he he sort of styles himself as being some kind of a seer or visionary or something, and that kind of, you know, he's kind of an eccentric and a bit of an outlier. But that kind of orthodoxy of anti-orthodoxy is a, a feature of the way capitalists, manager managerial types, explain themselves to themselves and to the rest of us. It's interesting you talk about the word creators. I was in. Birmingham recently and I was just in a shopping center and there was a, a sports shop and they had a big advertisement for a pair of Adidas new football boots, soccer boots. And the big blurb on it was saying, these boots are for creators only. <laughs> and I took a photo of it and it has like no fakers, creators, you know, <laughs> and it's called the nemesis. There you go. <laughs> yeah, right. So anti-orthodoxy right there. The nemesis, someone, you know, the bad guy. Yeah, I mean, that kind of marketing, and, and again, like the marketing of, uh, of rebellion is, you know, an old story, the way that consumer culture, you know, chews up rebellious subcultures and, and spits them out as marketable ones. I guess it's what one of the things I think that's kind of new and kind of, you know, kind of to me is interesting is the way that in the working world, in the business world in particular. And again, like a lot of what I'm talking about in this book is the language of management, you know, the language of bosses, basically, is the way that they have drawn on strands that emerged in, this, in, you know, in the 60s, the post-war period, in the 60s and 70s, as, as originally as forms of critique of uh, bourgeois life or of uh, professional life or of the office 
job or office culture or the organization. You know, so the idea of a creative environment in an office, the idea of a of a self actualized employee, self actualization is a term that comes up a lot in my book because it's you know it's like this term developed by this psychologist Abraham Maslow to describe the ways in which you kind of fulfill your deepest intrinsic desires through the work you do. So it's about this kind of identification between yourself and your and your work through which you gain a kind of psychic, I don't know, balance or peace or something. So the idea of like work as the, just like the horizon of life, the way in which you fulfill your destiny, the way in which you find yourself, the in which there's no like there's no outside to working life. That's I think increasingly a, a feature of our society. And, you know, it's, again, that's capitalism. It's always sort of been like that, but it's I think especially like that <laughs> these days. Is there more of an emphasis on on that as the average, say, mm -hmm. you know, amount of hours people are kind of assumed to should work has mm -hmm. gone up? Yeah, and and the other thing is that it's a feature of I think the desperation of our current moment. So one of the things that a lot of the words that I talk about in the book seem to have in common is this kind of uh, kind of relentless cheeriness, you know, like innovation, best practices, do it yourself, excellence, passion, all these kind of things like about that seem so chipper and optimistic, you know. But they're I think the products of a real sense of fear about the economic as well as just social, political, ecological future. So, you know, innovation being a good example, it's it's a word that seems to suggest that the sort of endless possibilities of any individual ingenious person. You know, you can innovate, anyone can be an innovator. But the way the word gets often used is to, to, to fantasize about solutions to just intractable social problems. Like you can, if you search, and I do this all the time, so I can assure you that this works. I had to do this a lot for researching the book. If you just search innovation and then like any intractable problem you can think of, there are a thousand articles like in the Harvard Business Review or in the Business Week or Forbes magazine or something explaining how someone is going to innovate the solution to you know climate change, world hunger, poverty, um, sexual assault, poor plumbing in the third world, malaria, you know. So it's, there's this like this fantasy about, um, but also this awareness of these intractable social problems in the sense that well, well if we have, we're out of other ideas, maybe we can just innovate our way out of this. And so I think there's like there's an undercurrent of despair beneath a lot of the the veneer of optimism here. And one other good example uh, that I talk about in the book is the phenomenon of the entrepreneurship summer camp and the entrepreneurship grade school. So you know, kids. And this is kind of a cross-class phenomenon, at least in the U.S., but in which kids as young as kindergartners, you know, as young as like five, six years old, are enrolled in academic programs that are promising to develop their entrepreneurial skills, you know, and, and, and then kids, in, you know, who are 10 years old get sent to uh, summer camps, and there's a lot of them where they, they're kind of learning how to write a business plan and to pitch investors and so forth. And this thing is, you know, this is uh, this has become a kind of normal thing, and it's a uh, to me, it's a profoundly sad thing that you know kids have to spend their summer not whatever collecting frogs and swimming or something, but instead going into a shark tank <laughs> with supposed investors and you know pitching their ten year old business idea. And it's a product of just you know their parents just fear that like when they're twenty, there's going to be no future for them, no kind of stable employment. So I think a lot of the contemporary culture of, of capitalism is motivated by that sense of real fear. Do you think that a lot of the words that, that you, you we discuss in here, there's a, an incredible mm -hmm. amount of self-helpery about them? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there definitely is. And it comes out of that, just that, that sense of desperation that I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and very little kind of social there's very little about like, you know, the kind of cooperative or joint effort. So much of it is about your individual motivation or skill. It, that's, that's one of the overriding themes of the book is the, 
just the glorification of individuality, individualism, and competition. Even the words that do seem to sort of invoke cooperation uh, do so in ways that are still geared towards maximizing individual productivity. So collaboration, uh, which is a word that I talk about. I wrote actually in collaboration with a friend in, in Britain named Bruno Diaz, who uh, supplied all of these kinds of, to me, bizarre anecdotes about the, the ways in which in a kind of high-end consultancy, uh, like the language and also the like office organization is all about supposedly breaking down hierarchies. Everyone sits in the same kind of desk. There's no cubicle walls or anything like that. And so it's about the, like, to per, it performs this kind of um, masquerade of horizontal collaboration in ways that are really about, I think, disguising, camouflaging hierarchy, but allowing people to exercise a certain, you know, need or certain desire for cooperation. But there's definitely no concept for solidarity in this vocabulary. You know, that's a word that I think so as yet can't can't quite be appropriated for the consultants or the managerial literature. The vocabulary is all about catch-ups, huddles, workshops, you know, borrowing on either the language of sports, like the huddle, the touchline huddle, or the team meeting and so forth, or uh, informal socializing, like catch-up, and or, you know, culture and art, like uh, the workshop. And so the idea here is to think perform a masquerade of a horizontal workplace in which everybody from the lowest secretary to the founder can talk to each other and have an equal kind of stake in things. And of course, that doesn't exist in any sort of material sense, but it's the, the overriding culture of a lot of workplaces now to kind of simulate that kind of equality. And so on one level, it's just a, it's just sort of a deception, but it's also, also, you know, guided towards maximizing individual productivity. So it all kind of comes back to that. I think the language of self-help has always been about, uh, but it's definitely about it now, about convincing its audience that not only is success within their grasp, but failure is also their fault, you know? It combines that sense of both endless possibility with you know, a total lack of any uh, systematic critique because it's not, a, it's about, you know, how you can transcend any obstacle rather than about emphasizing or describing what kind of social um, or structural obstacles there might be and counseling you about how to, you know, dig deep and to channel your own talents into to becoming a successful person. But there is also a vocabulary of what you might call cooperation in this language as well. So sharing, you know, as in the sharing economy, which purports to be a economy built around the pooling of resources and the sharing of knowledge and possessions. The word engagement, which is about, again, a kind of um, cooperation between an audience and a performer or between a city government and its citizens or something. The idea of the stakeholder, which imagines businesses as kind of as citizens, as participants in a local economy or in a local culture, which, and not as owners of capital or owners of resources that might have power over a particular community. You know, Mao is a, a business guru in a lot of different publications. That's Mao. Yeah, he's uh, in the economy. You can find it actually in uh, no less a publication than The Economist. There's an article about how Mao is the greatest, you know, business theorist of all time. I don't remember what the argument was. You know, it's it's a facetious and kind of stupid argument, but it's something that um, apparently in China itself has started to catch hold. But it's something that uh, English speaking writers who want to appear to be unorthodox have been claiming for a while. Well, The Economist has, has done some very stupid takes over the years, so that must be <laughs> right up there, um, along with, I remember reading The Economist. I used to be an avid reader at one stage in my for my sins, and they had this concept of uh, how to solve climate change was by creating giant CO2 filters that would filter <laughs> the CO2 out of it, and then we could use the CO2 in industry. So all we needed these massive things all over the place. Oh my yeah. God, it was so ridiculous. 
Yeah, I mean that's a that that's a common kind of feature of this sort of innovation economy rhetoric is basically the fantasy that you know we can just do what we're doing and not only avoid any broad consequences but actually you know can actually win in the end. You know, it's especially true of the the actual language of environmental sensitivity in the business world. Like the idea of sustainability is a word that appears to have a a kind of ecological consciousness, but when 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 you think about what s- sustainable means, it's a very attractive word for firms because it doesn't have any kind of standard of meaning. You know, so something can always be more sustainable than something else, or less sustainable than something else. So there's no sort of objective standard for running a sustainable mining company. It's just, or running a sustainable petroleum company. It's just, if you say it's sustainable. Or if it's more sustainable than the worst possible petroleum company, then it's sustainable. You know what? What rate is petroleum getting like generated and by decomposing? <laughs> yeah, life forms at the bottom of the sea. You know, like a gallon a year or something. Yeah, so you know it's sustaining slowly, but it's <laughs> still sustaining. Going back to your 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 thing of uh, self help books. I always kind of thought about self-help books, and I've done this myself, is that you you should only ever need to read one self-help book. But like the thing is that usually people who buy self-help books, they usually have loads of them. Yeah, and I always assume that many of them must give contradictory advice as well. Yeah, and I think more of all of they are really are is a pep talk. You know, you read one and it says, oh, do a list or something every day. And mm-hmm. then another one will say something else. But what happens to people is they do them for like a week or two weeks, and then they just slip back into their own, you know, <laughs> slipshod ways until they buy another one two months later. The yeah. language in the book, the self-help language in the book, the business stuff, it really irritates me. It really irritates me. The the self-help stuff in my book irritates Yeah, me? yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was what it was supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, leadership is one of the words I talk about. And I think that's where the self-help stuff comes in the most. It's a phenomenon that has a kind of a couple of really fundamental paradoxes, I think, because at least in the, you know, in the US, which is, you know, obviously it's the main my main archive here and I think the United States is area of self-help, a, you know, a world leader. <laughs> so, it's a it's a term that basically intrinsically fundamentally is about reverence for hierarchy, you know, because a leader is just like a euphemism for a boss, you know, but it's used increasingly in the U S in this kind of paradoxically democratic way. And I think that's kind of a, there's a long history of that too in U S self-help literature, but you know, we can all be leaders. That's the kind of the mantra you hear all the time. You know, anybody can be a leader It's just about being a leader in your particular field. So you can be a leader in your minimum wage job. The CEO of the company you work for is also a leader. You're both leaders. And again, it's a way of, of, you know, camouflaging those inequalities and, and also kind of inculcating in people this sense of their own kind of autonomy and their own agency. And that's the kind of good part about it, or that's what seems to be the good part about it. And and, you know, and it doesn't allow for any kind of sense of, you know, solidarity or consciousness uh, as of your shared obligations to other people. Could you want to tell us who this this dude, Valentine Voloshinov, is? <laughs> uh, the Soviet linguist. Well, yeah, he's there's some uh, a bit of mystery about who he was, because there's some speculation that he was, in fact, the same person as Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, the Soviet literary critic and linguist. But basically, he was a, um, if he in fact existed, he's a Soviet uh, linguist who was trying to bring Marxism to bear on the history of language. And so one of the, the thing I found, I think is really interesting about him is his concept of what he called multi-accentuality. So he kind of saw language as a as a terrain of social conflict, uh, in rather than as a as a science or as an innate human trait, in which you can kind of read past histories and past political struggles in the kind of words people use and in the language they speak. 
so multi accentuality is his concept for this the fact that like whenever we speak we're kind of speaking in the voices and one can hear the echoes of the past or of other kind of conflicts in our history and i'm kind of, i'm quite attracted to that idea i mean it's a bit of a perhaps of an abstract idea or a bit speculative but it was something that um, informed Raymond Williams, who's kind of my model for this book, and it kind of it really inspired me too to think about the ways that the language we use has meanings that we don't intend. It has it carries with it histories we don't appreciate or don't know that can be kind of explored if you crack open the word a bit. And so it's a kind of a, like a fossil of meanings that we've lost and meanings we can maybe in some cases recover. When I was reading the book, it really struck me something that was bugging me for quite a few years is the change in music on advertisements. <laughs> Had, have you noticed like this kind of hippie guitar music? Uh, <laughs> have Have you noticed this particularly on ads on YouTube? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I share your irritation there. Yeah. Like, I remember, like, growing up in the 80s and, you know, you had, like, Gillette, the best a man could get, you know, this kind of guitar music, Ferraris, even, like, tampons. In England, they had this ad for body form and they had this kind of, like, Tina Turner type screaming about <laughs> your body form, all the best a man. You know, it was, it was just bizarre music. And and now it's gone all it's gone very I don't know what the word is. It's not even hippie. It's kinda of gone very um Well it's all very sensitive and, and kind yes. of earnest, right? Earnest, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, do we see an evolution in language like the business speak in this same manner? Well, yeah, I think so. You know, that's like the big to me, uh, the big change in the way that business world regards itself and the way that conservative defenders of capitalism start to talk about the economy and you know like the middle of the 20th century you know after the depression and the war where you know when the allies were running planned economies and well everyone else was running a planned economy too i guess there's this widespread suspicion of big business you know because of the depression of course and a widespread appreciation of economic planning. And then the kind of, uh, you know, white collar business world is, is identified with bureaucracy, with the boredom and the homogeny of the suburbs, with, you know, the idea of the organization man who trudges off to work each day and is a conformist and, and so on. And then that starts to be replaced with this idea of the free market and the business world as a place where you can kind of really find yourself, you know, where you can become self-actualized, where you can discover your true leadership capacities, where you can pursue your passions. And there, that kind of like, I think, earnest language of self-fulfillment and, and, and in a lot of cases, it's like almost kind of a therapeutic language is something that's very characteristic of defenders of the free market. Well, since the last 50 years, and it's really intensified now as you're, careful attention to YouTube commercial jingles shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like the journey of Don Draper in Mad Men. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly, that. that is exactly it, yeah. I don't know if you saw, did you watch that series? I did, although I didn't watch that last season, but I, um, I, I, have, I did write a bit about, like a Abraham Maslow, this psychologist that I mentioned earlier, the self-actualization guy, was affiliated with that... Um, I forget what it's called. It's escaping me now. But that meditation center where Don Draper ends up at the end of the season. I mean, I read about it, but I didn't watch that last season. Yeah, it's interesting because he he has a, you know his 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 midlife crisis. It's more than a midlife crisis, kind of like an existential crisis. And what does he end up doing? It he he creates that ad for Coke that was really it was this groundbreaking ad for Coke. They make out the claim that Don ended up doing that. You know the uh, yeah 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 do, 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 yeah, like whatever the, it is. The buy the world of Coke, buy the world of Coke. You know, it's a very depressing <laughs> end to that. Yeah, show. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, speaking of meditation, because the the last shot of the show, right, is him meditating in some kind of uh, new age 
spiritualist kind of um, camp of some kind, right? And that's another good example, both of the moralism of the rhetoric of uh, business, but also this kind of earnestness that you're talking about is the is this kind of weird self fetishization of of Asia and the Orientalism of a lot of the the business world. So, you know, the celebration of what these. What is that? Well, yeah, it's the so. I mean, first of all, there's like a long history in self help of just believing that the mysteries of the East can help you triumph in the West. So that kind of goes back quite a ways. Again, like it's part of like the ways in which certain kind of bohemian aspects of like 60s bohemian culture gets absorbed by the business world. And so, you know, it's part, I think that's part of why Mao is celebrated as a business guru. I mean, and it's part of why we talk about business gurus as well. And it's why Don Draper goes and learns transcendental meditation or whatever it is he's doing. If you go, if you look at LinkedIn, if you just kind of go to LinkedIn or something and you search the words innovation guru or innovation Sherpa or Sherpa innovation ninja, you'll find like hundreds of job people who describe their jobs with those terms. So it's a frankly, you know, creepy and a uh, very common feature of the uh, moral earnestness of contemporary business culture is this kind of fetishization of the Orient, so, you know, quote unquote. To tell us about this lift ad that you mentioned in the book, particularly <laughs> horrifying. The pregnant, the pregnant lift driver, you mean? Yeah, that one. Yeah, so uh, I talk about this as an example of passion and the ad described, and I remember getting this in an email because I you know, used to have to use Lyft a lot, so I, I would get e marketing emails from them. It, it celebrated a woman who was nine months pregnant doing, you know, driving for Lyft and doing a, a fair when she started to go into labor, and she figured, well, I can, I can do another one. I can do one more run before I go to the hospital. So she did. So she picked up somebody while she was experiencing contractions and drove them wherever they needed to go and then drove herself to the hospital, and checked in, gave birth. And Lyft sent around this email, like th treated this as this triumph, you know, as this like brilliant example of her passion for driving people <laughs> around in her car for whatever middling percentage of the fare Lyft pays their drivers. You know, they got roundly denounced for it because people were kind of horrified that somebody's need to to work under those conditions and to do work that's, you know, requires you to, to be trapped in a car all day under those particular conditions was being celebrated as a example of someone's individual commitment, but also as just like the opportunity that Lyft gives you. I mean, that's the way that the sharing economy celebrates itself is this, it gives you autonomy, it gives you freedom, it gives you uh, an open schedule. The ad ended with this very cheerful statement in which Lyft welcomed the newborn baby into the Lyft family. <laughs> oh, my dear. It, you know, I see, uh, they, they tried to make it out like she was so passionate about being a taxi driver. She loved us so much. Yeah. In the, in the comedy. She was willing to risk her child's <laughs> health. You know. yes, yes. Yeah. And her own. And the combination of um, kind of old-fashioned paternalism in which the newborn baby is a part of the Lyft family and just total renunciation of any obligations that the company has to the employee, which is a characteristic feature of the sharing economy, is one of the things that's most perverse about it. Because, you know, whatever, at least uh, the paternalism of, um, you know, Henry Ford you, or General Motors, at least you <laughs> got... At least you got a pension out of it, but the paternalism of Lyft just gives you a half-hearted email solicit, you know, salutation to your newborn. I've just seen today that, um, speaking of our Chinese stuff, that Jack Ma, the chairman of Alibaba Group, do you know? Have you heard of this guy? Mm, no, I mean I've heard of Alibaba, but I don't know who the. Chair. So he's like he's like the head guy of it. What's interesting? He came out about a year ago saying that all the conditions were, all the technology was there for for actually using proper planning now for communism. <laughs> but like today, I think he's come out <laughs> with uh, with an idea of people should work uh, 12 hours a day from nine till nine, six days a week. So you got to wonder where the, <laughs> whether he's more influenced, what part of Mao he's been more influenced by. 
<laughs> My God, yeah, it's a mix up of <laughs> of stuff. Oh yeah, one thing that really irritates me is this idea of of people as a brand, which you bring up in the book. Like, yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm a big fan of for my sins of boxing. You know, I hear these boxing fans saying about certain boxers, oh, they should build their brand. And I feel like, like metaphorically punching them in the head if I could. But uh, it's <laughs> what's weird about the brand one is, is the origin of where it comes. How creepy that idea of person as a brand really is. Yeah, well, the, you know, the original meaning of brand is the burning of flesh to signify ownership, you know, and that was done on animals and it was done on people. And so it's a mark of ownership, a mark of property ownership. And so the, the, but the major, and the major transformation in the usage of the word into the 20th century was the transfer of the brand's possession from the owner of the brand to the consumer who acquires it. You go into a grocery store and you buy name brand toothpaste or something. So you've like acquired the brand. And the 21st century transformation of the word allows you to do more than just consume brands, but actually to become one yourself. So the thing that I find, you know, and I think you seem to find the same thing disturbing about it is, first of all, the way that that original mark of subjugation, domination has been seemingly lost, but also the ways in which maybe in ways that are not apparent the way it's kind of survived in the contemporary use of the word. So to, de to describe you know, a person's brand, what's paradoxical about it, and this is kind of similar to, in a way to the paradox of leadership, is that to have a personal brand, to brand yourself, is not seen as demeaning or belittling. It's seen as the way you realize your true possibilities as a person. So you become who you really are by branding yourself in, in some kind of very particular, specific way. And you do that, of course, to increase your you know, visibility uh, in the marketplace, you know, which is the horizon for, in this vocabulary anyway, the horizon for, for just human life and activity. Well, I guess, you know, one thing that I want to emphasize, because, you know, we've uh, been beating up on uh, the business world, is the way that a lot of the vocabulary that I talk about in the book is not just something used by kind of nitwit CEOs or management how-to self-help book writers, but also by people on, the, broadly speaking, on the left. The way that this kind of language of the market of privacy, of technophilia has kind of been smuggled into fields that we might think that are more the domain of cooperation and solidarity and, and so forth. And so... Like what? Well, like empowerment, for example, which is a word that got its start on the left um, as a way of... Um, in, a, in, a, in a couple different sort of milieus, and one of them was in kind of feminist social work in the United States as a kind of counter to the slogan of black power to talk about empowerment as a kind of process by which people shut out of political authority and especially people who worked in kind of, you know, in care work, people who were, you know, who were teachers, who were caretakers and so forth, could access some degree of influence and autonomy in their community. And then it was also used as a way of uh, critiquing mainstream development economics, you know, in the global south to say, that, you know, the ways that we measure economic growth just take these metrics that you know are about like whatever the gross domestic product or about you know these kind of economic metrics that leave out the kind of invisible work that people mostly women do or especially women do you know in teaching and caretaking and raising families and working informally in ways that are not visible to you know statisticians or economists and so forth so empowerment was a way of talking about how to improve the lives of those people in ways that were not measurable through like normal metrics of economic growth. But the word's gotten kind of, um, I think, co-opted and it was available to be co-opted for a kind of consumer feminism because of the ways in which it 
talks about political power as a as a process without a kind of defined endpoint or a defined target. And that was originally, you know, the point. It was about talking about these kind of processes that are not exactly visible or are slow and are off the books and kind of like the like the work of teaching a child or raising a family and so forth. But that kind of um, abstraction or no, abstraction is not the right word, but that kind of invisibility is what allows the the word empowerment now to just describe in a vague and kind of often ineffectual way some kind of token improvement or some kind of consumer simulation of you know transformation so like the 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 way that empowerment gets used as a as a feminist consumer slogan you know you can buy like empowerment you can buy like a deodorant empowerment deodorant or you can buy empowerment uh, lipstick or whatever you know so it's a it's a way that invokes power without kind of identifying it and again it's one of these words that has this kind of real optimism about it it's about giving everybody about recognizing everyone's potential about recognizing everyone the work that everybody does i mean that's ostensibly what empowerment kind of rhetoric is about you know instead of just talking about the big leaders or the big organizations or something. We're talking about the the man or woman on the corner in the street, you know, but it's the way it's become used is, is in a way that kind of renounces the need to identify who, where power resides and who wields it, who has it and who doesn't. So before, before we finish up, I've got one more question for you, John. Yeah. How many people do you reckon actually read and search through LinkedIn as a pastime like yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope, I hope nobody. I hope, I hope this is mine. Is it possible oh, you're the no. only one of 7 billion on the planet that does that? <laughs> I may be one of the only people that reads it at all. That's quite true. I actually return those emails, you know, respond to those emails. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not reply. You're the only guy replying. <laughs> well, thanks very much, John, for coming on the show today. Oh, well, thanks a lot for inviting me. This was, this was fun. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening. Please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega.